Come on, Cap. Hurry up. You're not the only one who has to prepare for the show. Cap? Where does he get off monopolizing the only bathroom in the place? Yeah, Cast. You have to talk to him. This is getting crazy. That's my word, troll. What's this? He put a star above the bathroom door? What's wrong with him? I don't know. Ever since he turned 50, he's acted like he's had one foot in the grave already. Yeah? The hell are you guys looking at? None of you are a prize without makeup. Summer event ends. Summer giveaway announced. Star Trek Las Vegas. All this and more in the news. Tonight's news brought to you by the Orion Records upcoming release, Chalaski Sings. Available soon on Isolinear Chip, Rod, and special release Bioneural Gel Pack and classic data tape formats. Hi there, folks. It's me again, Crazy Chalaski. But I'm here tonight to tell you about my latest creative career conquest. I've maneuvered myself in with musical masterminds to produce a performance of the classics as only Crazy Chalasky can. That's right, I made an album. The consummate collection of compositions from all over the known universe. I know you're going to go crazy yourself over this unparalleled audio offering. I'm calling it Chalasky Saints, because that's what I do. It's a cacophony of crooning the like of which none of you out there have heard before. Classic after classic comes careening into your cranium. This is a promise. So run out right now while they're still available. Act now, and I'm going to throw in a behind-the-scenes video of my recording sessions. I honestly don't know how an average humanoid can possibly stand all of this quality entertainment at once, but I'm willing to test the limits. That's right, because I'm Crazy Chalasky. Say it with me, Crazy, Crazy, Crazy Chalasky. And my talent is insane. In tonight's news, the summer giveaway has been announced. Though this will already be occurring as this podcast goes to air, starting on Monday, August 12th through Friday, August 16th of 2013, there will be at least one C-Store item free for a 24-hour period, ranging from costumes to ships to who knows. All we do know for certain is that they are account-wide unlocks. The summer event is ending. The summer event on Ryza will stop giving its favors on August 19th. They will still be available on the Lobby store until August 31st, as well as the Pearls. The Pearl portion of the events ended on August 7th. Star Trek Las Vegas! There was a live panel at Star Trek Las Vegas featuring the devs from Star Trek Online. This live panel revealed that the Voth will be coming to the game. A battle zone in A, or the Dyson Sphere from Star Trek Next Generation, will be released. It is apparently going to be a battle zone involving the Voth. They will start a new featured episode chain in September, which is designed to bridge storylines. It seems that it will be only the first episode being released this time. It's possible that customizable ship interiors might be coming via the Foundry. The Special Task Force are being retrofitted to bring story back into it somehow, and hints that next year all ships might be playable by all factions. 
And finally, the gateway will be potentially getting some form of crafting integration, possibly similar to that that's in Neverwinter. Hopefully this and more will become clearer as Star Trek Online releases news posts about them. Mine Project 4. This is a cosmetic project that will unlock dilithium deposits on the exterior ground portion of the map. Romulan Temporal Ships released. These ships were released into the Tau Shiar lockboxes and are not in the foundry at this time if I am correct in my information. Additionally, the Tau Shiar lockbox will be going away. On August 15th, the lockbox drops will stop for the last time, for the moment. Who knows what this will be replaced with? This information might be released at the time of this podcast airing, so stay tuned. And this has just been handed to me. A new build has gone to triple, which removes the ability to create Romulan-specific missions and makes changes to fleet leadership. The Foundry change removes the ability to designate a mission as a Romulan-specific one, though it does leave all of the Romulan character and shift elements in the editor to use. Our crack research team informs me that the Romulan temporal ships are indeed available in the editor. Also, my producer is informing me that we now have a subspace link to our reporter at large, P.F. Dennis, reporting from the scene of Star Trek Las Vegas. Over to you, Paul. Hey, cast. I'm here on what is just another beautiful night here at the Rio Hotel and Casino in fabulous Las Vegas for the 2013 Creation Entertainment Annual Star Trek Extravaganza. The air is electric out here, but the excitement is inside, as there must be a hundred Star Trek celebs here for this special anniversary convention. As you know, it is Deep Space Nine's 20th birthday. Let's go inside. It must be getting that time again. They're just about to do the head count here to see if the costume record will be broken. Wow, look at these wonderful authentic costumes. Is that a real Ferengi standing next to me in his loose-fitting attempt at an STO uniform? And to my left here, I almost called her Jerry. Amazing. Well, better get out of the way. Wait a second. Are you guys here for the head count? Jeez, I don't remember that episode. Shit, is that Steve Sanders? Wait, anyway, wait, wait, what? Paul? I-, I can hardly hear you. Let me get back to my room. Whew, that's better. I needed a rest anyway. Paul, you're not really in Las Vegas, are you? Uh, no, actually, not really. <sighs> Additionally, the fleet leadership locations are designed in such a way that hopefully another incident such as the now infamous hijack and destruction of Caspian Division can never occur again. Priority One continued to release its visit to Cryptic Studios, and massively also continued to release Terry's visit to Cryptic, continuing with her talk with Dan Stahl about things Foundry and beyond. Go give it a read. And finally, Star Trek Online was featured in the summer issue of Star Trek the Magazine with an article about the summer event, which I have to ask, why is all the press for this event happening when it's wrapping up? And also a new story featuring the new chief engineer of the Enterprise F. Go give it a read. And that was the news. Welcome to Kirk's Fat Assets. In this edition, I'm counting down the top 10 props on new Romulus that I'd love to see in the Foundry. Without further ado, let's do it. Number 10. This building. At first, this was higher on my list until I took a look at the buildings that we already have in the Foundry. It's very similar to what we already have, but it's still different and nice. So it made the list. Number 9. The Ropes. Now these will be incredibly useful if we can get Neverwinter's Nudger tool. We could do a lot with the ropes if we could rotate them on each axis. Number 8. The fence. I'm not sure what I'd build with it, but I'm certain that I'd use it to make some really crazy things. Please add. Number 7. These guys. I have no idea what they are, but I like them. They would be versatile props. Number 6. The tent. Yes, we already have a tent, but it's pretty small. It's difficult to do much with it. I like this tent better. Number 5. The cots. I can count many, many times where I've needed a cot, yet I don't have a cot. Please add. Number 4. 
the cloth wall thingies. We sort of have a few lamp posts with cloth joining them together, but I could build a lot of cool things with these guys. Number three. The ship. You're probably thinking why it's not higher on the list, because it's so cool. And indeed, it is one of those things that would be spectacular to have in the foundry, but there are only so many ways to use it, I think. So it made the list at number three. Number two. The data pad. We have a big, bulky data pad that's useful, but these little ones are much better. They would be great for giving players something to pick up, carry, and collect. Not number one. The not number one item is the circular transporter pad. This is not number one because, well, it was already number one in my top ten fat assets of Ryza. Again, if we had this circular platform, we'd use it everywhere. Number one. The stairs. Yes, it's possible to make our own stairs like I had to do here. It's a pain in the ass and a resource hog to have to use 30 or 40 platforms or more just to make a set of stairs. We need a good few sets of stairs that would save lots of time and lots of frustration. So those are my top 10 picks for new Romulus. Let's hope our Romulan foundry isn't a desolate wasteland like the original Romulan homeworld. That's all for now. Stay tuned for the rest of the show. Hello, I am Solicitor Bram. You may know me from my other ads and appearances on the UFP networks. I'm here to talk to you tonight about Eudonitis myocloria, or Gatron's disease. This affliction has become common among dilithium miners all over the galaxy. It is terminal, and there is no cure. I do, however, prescribe large doses of latinum as a treatment. Gold Press Latinum makes everyone feel better, especially me. So if you or a loved one have contracted this deadly ailment, contact my office immediately. I will fight the mining consortiums to get you the compensation we deserve. Honestly, what do you have to lose? You're not going to be around long enough to care. At least you'll go to the grave knowing that we hit these jokers where it hurts them most. Watch this. Well, it looks like those miners are going with a public defender. We've got this all wrapped up. They don't stand a chance. Wait, it looks like they've changed counsel. They're going with Solicitor Bran instead. Oh no, that is bad news for our clients. We had better just settle this one. What are you upset about? The consortium pays us win or lose. Oh yes, I'll call Bran and let him know when to expect all the Vatnum. See? The whole system is geared toward moving these cases along as quickly as possible. After all, no one likes to hear about sick people. This is a happy utopian society and sickness is so negative. So contact me today, and trust me, you'll be buried in a pure latinum container. Like the song says, for compensation, I'm your man. Contact me today. Brand, 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 he'll fix your problem if he can, oh, brand, 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 for compensation, he's your man. This time around, we took our choice from our mailbag. Two missions were submitted by the fledgling foundry author, Alice Vanya. They are Star Trek Saturn, Episodes 1 and 2. Unfortunately, we can only review one at a time, so we went with Episode 1. The mission begins with the player being directed towards Vulcan and an old, well-respected ambassador who may have information regarding a missing vessel. From Vulcan, the player is directed to several systems, collecting pieces of the story. Keeping in mind that this is the debut mission by Alice Vanya, we have no intention of discouraging a new author by raking a mission over the coals. Rather, we will offer what we believe to be sound advice on the fundamentals. Let's begin with story. This category is difficult on this occasion because the story was incomplete. Playing Episode 2 is a requirement for resolution on any level here, which might be an area that the author could revisit. It might whet the player's appetite for more if he or she is given some solid piece of the puzzle, leading him or her to speculate as to where it all ties together. I found that I was left with a collection of loose ends that I'm sure would be tied up in Episode 2, but had no more of an idea what was going on than when I clicked on the Accept button in the beginning. 
It is this humble reviewer's feeling that there should have been more of a reward for the time investment. On a positive note, the dialogue was well written for the most part. It was very formal and Trek-like at the appropriate times. Very few spelling and grammar issues. Yeah, it's very difficult to judge the story based solely on part one, but I'm very eager to play part two to see where it goes. I will say that it's clear that this new author is enthusiastic about using the Foundry to tell her stories. Except for some slang, she writes clearly and nicely. I do think that part one could have a bit more of a story in terms of uncovering a mystery and solving at least a part of it. I felt like the mission ended when the author simply ran out of maps. I did like many of the characters who each have interesting personality. I also enjoyed it that the author put her own tune in the mission. I like it when people do that. Map Design The maps were the typical stock maps, and that is just fine for a first mission, as the author is not yet comfortable with all the tools and assets available. They all suited the story well. The issue I would mention is the frequency of map transitions. It is a common mistake with authors early in their experience to use maps in this way. There were no more than one or two objectives per map. For example, the player beamed down to the planet's surface, conversed with an NPC, beamed up to a battle, destroyed the ship, and warped out of the map. This happened a few times. Most players would rather not have to endure the waiting times of these map transitions. It might be worth a look to see if some of these objectives can be consolidated onto the same map, cutting down on transition time. I agree with the captain as usual. There were a lot of unnecessary transitions. For example, the author has us go to Earth to interact with a panel, which sends us to Vulcan space to beam down to Vulcan ground where we have to spend several minutes climbing the summit to speak to a wise Vulcan, who then sends us to the place where we should have gone first. It was overkill. Everything that happened on the first couple of maps could be consolidated into a long-range communique with the wise Vulcan. Still, it's understandable that a new author would fall into this trap. Tech Tech was fine. There were no foundry tricks to speak of, except for a little sleight of hand for an NPC change that worked perfectly. Dialogues were well placed and to the point. All directions were accurate and concise throughout. I agree with the captain about the NPC trick, and that's impressive for a first-time author to really pull off. Otherwise, I think this category could use some work. In particular, a space map has three very small reach markers that are almost impossible to find, especially in a small ship like the Defiant. Again, this is just an all-too-common mistake by a new author, so it's understandable. But my advice for the author is, please greatly increase the size of the reach markers in space, or better yet, use invisible objects that the player must scan. Our scanners would lead the way. Now on to difficulty. I wouldn't say that there was any great difficulty in defeating any enemy group. There were not a lot of them to begin with, but there seemed to be a need for each. It's hard to be sure, though, at this point in the story. It is also understood that being a new author, Alice Vanya has yet to grow accustomed to mob strengths and the numbers required for a challenging yet manageable combat scenario. That balance will evolve over time. It's a really tricky thing to master. I definitely think the space mobs could be more difficult. I flew a Defiant and easily took on three frigates at once, and my shields didn't drop below 99%. Knowing that the ships posed no real threat, it got tedious very quickly. Yet, like many other aspects of this mission, it's something that could be easily fixed as this author continues to learn the toolset. So my advice to the author is please keep making missions, keep improving your missions. Part 1 shows a lot of potential. So please, don't be discouraged by our criticisms. You're somebody to watch. It may be unorthodox for us not to have rated categories, but we felt that, as a first mission, we would just provide an overall score with the intention of replaying the mission if and when Alice Vanya makes any changes after learning more about the process. We feel that there is great potential here, and as Kirkvat said, Alice Vanya will be one to watch. Star Trek Saturn Episode 1 easily gets 3.5 out of 5 stars overall. Every Foundry author, regardless of experience, is still learning, as the tool itself changes and our skills improve. It is our hope that the authors get some benefit from our advice, as you are in no way obligated to agree with our point of view, and it is our privilege to have shared what you have created. We know it can be difficult to hear criticism, especially when there are plenty of reviewers who delight in delivering it. But here, at Primetime UGC, our job is to encourage authors, not dress them down. The minute we begin to foolishly imagine that a mission is only good if it impresses us, is the minute we must get our arrogance in check. We're Starbase UGC, and we want you to keep making missions, and to make them better and better, your way. After all, if everyone did things the same way, I think we'd all be bored.
This has been the Mini Mission Review on Episode 26 of Primetime UGC. Forge your dreams in the foundry. Go forth and make content. Good night, and see you next time.